A linear graph is a line-shaped graph that can be written as y equals mx plus b. m is the slope. For every one unit you go to the right, you rise by m units. b represents the y-coordinate of the y-intercept, which is the point where the graph crosses the y-axis. This can be found by setting x equal to 0 in the equation y equals mx plus b which gives y equals m times 0 plus b, or y equals b. Because the form y equals mx plus b directly gives the slope and the y-intercept of the graph, it is called slope-intercept form. A linear function is a special case of a polynomial function. It is a first-degree polynomial. It is also possible to write an equation for a linear graph given its slope m, and a point that it passes through, x1, y1. We begin with the equation, y equals mx, which gives us a line of slope m passing through the origin. We can shift it vertically by y1 by replacing y with y minus y1. y minus y1 equals mx. Then we can shift it horizontally by x1 by replacing x with x minus x1. y minus y1 equals m times quantity x minus x1. Overall, shifting the line has the effect of moving the line to intersect the point x1 comma y1, where the point x1 comma y1 basically acts like the origin did. This form of the equation is known as point-slope form. The final common form is called standard form, which is ax plus by equals c, where a, b, and c are integers. This form separates out the variable terms from the constant term. However, note that some linear equations can't be rewritten in standard form, like y equals square root 2 times x. Linear equations are used to model variables with a constant rate of change. For example, the acceleration of a falling object is proportional to the time it has fallen, so the graph of a falling object's acceleration over time is a straight line. A quadratic graph comes from a second-degree polynomial function, y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Every quadratic graph is a parabola, which is a roughly u-shaped curve. If a is positive, then the parabola opens upward. If a is negative, then the parabola opens downward. The greater the magnitude of a, the more sharply the parabola bends. The graph of a quadratic function can help you find the points where the function attains a value of zero, often simply called the zeros or roots of the function. Equivalently, these are the points where the graph intersects the x-axis. In general, for a quadratic function, there are three cases to consider. Two x-axis intersections. The function has two real valued zeros, each with multiplicity one. This also means that the discriminant of the function, b squared minus 4ac, is positive. The discriminant is the value inside the square root in the quadratic formula x equals negative b plus or minus square root quantity b squared minus 4ac over 2 a. One x-axis intersection. The function has one real valued zero, which has a multiplicity of two. This means the discriminant is equal to zero. No x-axis intersections. The function has no real valued zeros. Its zeros exist only in the complex numbers. When this is true, the discriminant is negative. Quadratics have many uses in modeling phenomena in the real world. One of the simplest examples is parabolic motion. A projectile, an airborne object with no forces acting upon it except gravity, traces out the shape of a parabola as it flies through the air. A parabola is an example of a conic section, which is, roughly speaking, the intersection between an infinitely large cone and a plane slicing through it. The equation for the graph of a circle is quantity x minus h squared plus quantity y minus k squared equals r squared, where r is the radius and h comma k is the center of the circle. This equation can be derived from the definition of the circle and the Pythagorean theorem. 
A circle is defined as the set of all points in a plane that are at an equal distance, the radius from a given point, the center. For the simplest case, imagine a circle centered at the origin. Draw a radius line segment from the center of the circle to some point on the circle. This line segment's length is r. Now, say that the point on the circle has coordinates x, y. Draw a vertical line segment from that point to the x-axis. Then draw a line segment from the point you reached back to the origin. The three line segments form a right triangle. The lengths of its legs are x and y, and the length of its hypotenuse is r. Now we can just apply the Pythagorean theorem. x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So we know that this equation captures that particular point on the circle. But there's nothing special about the point we choose. We can do the exact same thing for all of the infinitely many points of the circle. Thus, x squared plus y squared equals r squared defines a circle of radius r centered at the origin. To generalize this so the circle can be anywhere in the plane, we must think about graph transformations. Replacing x with x minus h shifts the graph h units to the right within the plane. You could think of this as shifting the plane to the left while leaving the graph in place, meaning the graph moved relatively to the right as a result. Similarly, replacing y with y minus k shifts the graph k units upward. So, to center the circle at the point h comma k, we just have to use the following equation. Quantity x minus h squared plus quantity y minus k squared equals r squared. One important case is the circle of radius 1 centered at the origin, given by x squared plus y squared equals 1. This circle is the basis of the trigonometric functions sine and cosine. If you start at the right of the circle and travel some distance theta counterclockwise around the unit circle, then sine theta gives you your y-coordinate and cosine theta gives you your x-coordinate. Similarly to a circle, an ellipse is defined using distances from points. In the ellipse's case, it uses two points, each of which is called a focal point or a focus, plural being foci. An ellipse is defined as follows. If you choose any point on the ellipse, take the distances from that point to each of the focal points, then add those distances up, you will always get the same number no matter which point you choose. Thus, the ellipse is a generalization of the circle. The circle is simply the special case where the two focal points are the same point. An ellipse can also be thought of as a stretched out circle. The equation for an ellipse centered at the origin with a width of 2a and a height of 2b is x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. The farthest points on the ellipse from the center are called the vertices of the ellipse, and the closest points are called the covertices. A line segment from the center to a vertex is called a semi-major axis, and one from the center to a covertex is called a semi-minor axis. The distance c from the center to a focus is called the ellipse's linear eccentricity, and the value e equals c over a is its eccentricity. Like a parabola, an ellipse is also an example of a conic section. You could slice through a cone to get an ellipse. This is true even in the special case of a circle. A hyperbola is a curve consisting of two roughly U-shaped pieces, or branches, bending away from each other. It can be defined in various ways, including as a conic section, like the parabola and the ellipse. It can also be defined using two focal points, just like the ellipse, only using the absolute difference of the distances, rather than the sum. A hyperbola centered at the origin can be given the following equations. x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equals 1, y squared over a squared minus x squared over b squared equals 1. This is similar to the equation for the ellipse, but with subtraction instead of addition. If x is in the first term, then the hyperbola opens sideways. If y is in the first term, the hyperbola opens up and down. The two points of the hyperbola closest to its center are called its vertices. 
The line segment between these vertices is called the transverse axis. The hyperbola has two asymptotes, where an asymptote is a line that you get closer and closer to as you approach infinity. The unit hyperbola is the hyperbola given by x squared minus y squared equals 1. It is the basis of the hyperbolic functions, hyperbolic sine, sine h, and hyperbolic cosine, cosine h, which are analogous to the ordinary trigonometric functions. If you draw a line segment from the center to a point on the right half of the unit hyperbola, then the signed area bounded by the line segment, the hyperbola, and the x-axis is denoted by a divided by 2. Signed area means that if the area is below the x-axis, it's counted as negative. The point where your line segment hits the unit circle has coordinates cosine h of a, comma, sine h a. Sine and cosine are two of the basic trigonometric functions. They give the coordinates of a point on the unit circle given a distance theta that it has traveled around. The graphs of sine and cosine look like waves and just swing up and down between negative 1 and 1 forever, which reflects the function's cyclical nature. Waves of this form are known as sinusoidal waves. Due to this swinging behavior, they do not have a limit as their input reaches infinity. The period of the sine function, or the amount of time it takes to complete one cycle, is 2 pi. This is also known as tau, the ratio of a circle's circumference to its radius, meaning the number of times that the radius fits into the circumference, about 6.28. At theta equals 0, sine of theta equals 0. Then at theta equals 1 quarter tau, or 1 fourth of the way around the unit circle, sine of theta reaches a maximum value of 1. At theta equals 1 half tau, halfway around the unit circle, sine of theta returns to 0. At theta equals 3 quarters tau, sine theta reaches a minimum of negative 1, and at theta equals tau, all the way around the unit circle, sine theta is back to 0 again, and the sine function has completed a full cycle. Similarly, the cosine function also has a period of tau. At theta equals 0, cosine of theta equals 1. Theta equals 1 quarter tau, cosine of theta equals 0. Theta equals 1 half tau, cosine theta equals negative 1. Theta equals 3 quarters tau, cosine theta equals 0. And theta equals tau, cosine theta equals 1. An exponential function is a function of the form y equals a to the power of x. This can be used to model either exponential growth or exponential decay, depending on whether a is greater than or less than 1. For a greater than 1, the function grows as its input increases. It approaches 0 on the left and rises toward infinity on the right. Meanwhile, for 0 less than a less than 1, the function actually does the reverse trending downward from positive infinity on the left and decaying asymptotically toward zero on the right. This corresponds to the fact that repeatedly multiplying a number bigger than one by itself will give you a bigger number, but for a number less than one, you'll get a smaller number. If you try plugging in a equals one, you get the function y equals one to the power of x, which just reduces to y equals one so it doesn't grow or decay in either direction. You can also plug in a equals 0 to get y equals 0 to the power of x. This can be broken up into three parts, x greater than 0, x equal to 0, and x less than 0. For x greater than 0, the value of 0 to the power of x is just 0, meaning the graph for positive x is the same as y equals 0. For x less than 0, the expression 0 to the power of x is actually undefined. You can't raise 0 to a negative power. Thus, the graph actually doesn't exist for negative x. As for x equals 0, that would require evaluating 0 to the power of 0. The value of this expression is actually not universally agreed upon. Different people hold it to have different meanings or different justifications. It is conventionally either given the value of 1 or left undefined, so the graph may or may not include the point 0, 1, depending on the convention used. 
In calculus, the most important exponential function is y equals e to the x power, where e is Euler's number. y equals e to the x power, also denoted by exponential x, is its own derivative. The rate of change at each point is the same as the value of the function at that point. d dx of e to the x equals e to the x. Due to this, it is also its own antiderivative, so it can be obtained by integrating itself. The integral of negative infinity to x of e to the t power dt equals e to the x power. In terms of the graph of the function, this means that any given point on the graph, the height above the x-axis, the slope of the tangent line, and the area under the curve from negative infinity to that point are the exact same value. A logarithm, denoted by log, is an inverse function to an exponential function. Essentially, for any appropriate a and x, log base a of a to the power of x equals x, where a is called the base of the logarithm. In calculus, similarly to how e to the x power is the most important exponential function, the logarithm with base e is the most important logarithmic function. This logarithm has a special name the natural logarithm, usually denoted by ln. Other frequently used logarithms are the common logarithm, base 10, and the binary logarithm, base 2, with the latter being common in computer science. The graph of any inverse function can be created by taking the graph of the original function and reflecting it across the line y equals x. If we use the natural logarithm, what we get is a curve that shoots up from negative infinity to the right of x equals 0, crosses the x-axis at x equals 1, and then grows more and more slowly as it goes to the right. However, its growth is unbounded, so it will reach arbitrarily high values if you go far enough to the right. We can also graph the common logarithm, which has a bigger base, so it grows more slowly and the binary logarithm, which has a smaller base, so it grows faster. You can also use a base between 0 and 1 for the logarithm. This results in a graph that plummets from positive infinity, crosses through the x-axis at x equals 1, and decreases more and more forever. If you replace the base of a logarithm with its reciprocal, this is the effect of flipping the graph across the x-axis. For example, the graph of logarithm base 1 half of x is just a flipped version of the graph of logarithm base 2 of x. The natural logarithm is important in calculus because its derivative is y equals 1 over x. Correspondingly, by integrating this function, you can get to natural log of x. Natural log x equals the integral of 1 to x of 1 over t dt. This is one possible definition of the natural logarithm.